if you're just joining us, I want to welcome everyone. We are uh, just going to give everybody a few minutes to log in. Looks like the number of sign-ins have slowed down. So, okay. Yeah. All right. We can go ahead and get started. Hopefully, a few others will will join. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're we're looking forward to this month's Death Side Chat with Dr. Manny. My name is Lisa Mindell. I am here with um, Natalie Mason. Uh, we are co-presidents of the Harbor Fields Council of PTA's executive board. Um, and we're here with Dr. Manning, as well as Sue Broderick, who is SEPTA's president this year. And Sue is co-hosting tonight's event with us. So um, we're very excited to have her here. And we are looking forward to answering some great questions that we received from all of the PTA units um, that include a lot of questions from our community and parents. So we appreciate them pulling those all together for us. And we will be covering a range of topics this evening. Um, and before we get started, just want to hand it over to Sue so she can say hi and, and welcome everyone. Hi, good evening, Harbor Fields. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. I think that these events are super important, especially uh, now as all of our kids are coming back. We're so excited. The kids are all back. And I know that Dr. Manning has so much information to share. So I don't want to take up any more time. Dr. Manning, go for it. Thank you, Ms. Broderick. And I have to say I'm jealous of the fireplace. I never <laughs> thought sitting there. <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful sight. It's um, a cold day. Yeah, yeah. I just, uh, first of all, I want to say I'm just so excited to be here. Uh, I got to thank all the PTA units, PTA council uh, for your efforts. I know what it takes to coordinate an event like this, the time you put into it. Um, time out of your day, and I just, I'm so grateful. So thank you. Um, really exciting events this week. As you know, we uh, welcome back a good majority of our students at Oldfield Middle School and Harbor Fields High School. Uh, so tomorrow is the last day of our phase in for grades eight and nine. And we're just, I can't say enough. We're just open the moon. We're really excited. Uh, I just want to say, you know, to those parents and students that remain on remote instruction, I want to look at you in the camera here and just say, you know, want to assure you that you still are a, and always will be an important part of our classroom and our Harbor Fields family. Uh, you know, we call ourselves a Harbor Fields family for a reason. And that's because we, we understand that uh, all, of our, all of our students play an important part in what makes us special. So uh, that's just a, I want to make sure that that is known to all of our families. Um, and I have to make one plug before we turn it back over, if you don't mind, uh, to one of our high school students, um, Aaliyah Steinberg, who's receiving an award tonight. And I feel terrible that I can't be in two places at one time, uh, but you know, I know our high school principal, Mr. Russo is there. Aaliyah's receiving a Students Building Bridges Award uh, from the Jewish Council, of, uh, sorry, Jewish Community Relations Council of Long Island. So congratulations to Aaliyah um, on that. And I, like I said, I wish I could be there. And, uh, Finally, I hope everyone had a chance to see the upcoming community event that's being organized by a diversity, equity, and inclusion task force. Um, it's called Walk a Mile in Each Other's Views. This is a virtual interactive event that's gonna be held on April 22nd. So we'll be sending out more information on that. If you haven't had a chance to register, please make sure you sign up as soon as possible because it is limited to 300 individuals, uh, the first 300. So. Those are just my little plugs and welcome. So thank you so much. And I'll turn it back over to, to you. Ms. Broderick, right? Okay, fantastic. 
So just um, a few questions that came in uh, from our SEPTA folks. Um, the first one is, what do you see your role being in smoothing out the transition of leadership now in pupil personnel services? Okay, thank you. Um, it's a good question because just want to make sure that everybody on the screen understands that we did have, um, uh, we're searching in the process right now, searching for a new director of pupil personnel services our PPS department. Uh, so uh, obviously, as with all positions, it's a very important position in our district. Uh, it's important that we get the right person in all of our leadership roles. So that's a, some, you know, a search process that we obviously take very seriously and we're taking our time with it. Um, you know, my, my role in that is obviously supportive. Um, I see my role in, in, and as you may know, we have transitioned in multiple positions this year. So our, our, you know, our, our best practices is to make sure we get the best candidate in the position, support them during that transition, and then provide the level of supervision necessary for their success. I know that, you know, my role has to be very active in that process, and that's, that's my plan for this, uh, for this particular position going forward. I'm really excited about the, the transition. I'm excited about the future and the potential uh, for growth within the department, and I'm looking forward to that process. So I hope I answered your question. I think supportive is perfect. Um, the next one is, will there be any additional programs to help our special education students at the secondary level reacclimate now? And now that they're back, how will we identify and address any learning gaps that exist? So um, learning gaps, I know learning gaps come a lot, up a lot. Uh, it's, a, it's a topic that's on the minds of a lot of parents. And as many of you know, I have three children of my own at home. And so I, it's, it's personal to me. I understand those concerns for sure. And I think the answer to that, you know, it's, it's fairly straightforward in that the return to in-person learning um, at the secondary levels and what we've been able to do at the elementary levels uh, being in-person all year long is providing that equitable learning environment for all students. I always say the same thing, that if I can get students in the classroom, I can level the playing field. So I don't have to, for example, always a concern when students are remote or hybrid is what is the learning environment at home and do students have support that they need? So we know in the classroom that the learning environment is equitable and the supports are there. And then it's a matter of allowing the teachers to do what they do best. I know that you know we have the, the best staff that any superintendent can ask for. And so, when I have the students with our teachers and they're engaged in their assessment process, they're using the tools and the programs that the district provides and they're engaged within the RTI process and supporting students with the home parent involvement. Uh, these are all the recipe for success that we've used. So that through that assessment process, through the RTI process, we'll be able to develop an understanding of learning gaps as they exist, develop a plan for remediation of those gaps use research-based strategies to address any gaps that exist. And I'm confident that, you know, our, our staff, you know, those, our students are in great hands with our staff. But I encourage parents that have concerns to reach out to their teachers, express those concerns. Because I know, like, I, again, I'll go back to my own children. If I sit down and I help my son with homework, he might behave with me differently than he behaves in school. So he might express frustration with something, but may not, do that necessarily with it with his teachers. So I would encourage parents to reach out to to the teachers and just say, hey, this is what I'm experiencing at home when I help my child with math or science or whatever it might be that they're doing. Um, he or she is expressing frustration and, and, and having a difficult time. Allow the teacher to understand that because again, the child might not be exhibiting that in school necessarily. They might not be verbalizing their frustration. And you know, you that you might not necessarily want to wait for that to come out on an assessment. But again, our student, our teachers do a wonderful job of assessing our students formally, informally, every day. Um, and I'm sure they, you know, if parents were to engage in those conversations with the teachers, they would understand quickly that the teachers have a good understanding of where their child is at and uh, any concerns that need to be addressed. Great, thank you. Um, so from the high school PTSA, we have a few. Um, now that the kids are back full time, do you foresee a normal return in September? 
I love that in quotes. Yeah. Um, and if not, what changes at the high school level do you think they'll be? So uh, one thing I've learned over the past year, and I'm sure you've learned the same lesson, is I try not to predict the future beyond a few days uh, because as we all know, things change on a dime, right? So as of tomorrow at the high school and certainly at the middle school, we will welcome back a large majority of our students and we'll have a, that, them all in school. Um, so I know that when we did that calculation for the plan, we were prepared to accept all students back. So we have a few that were remaining on remote, so like I said, a small percentage. Uh, but if I look forward to September, I don't know that I see that much changing. I, you know, I know that you know, I've been asked before about remote you know, coming back in, in September. People should know that that's really out of the school district's hands as you, know, you, you might be aware that New York State requires districts to have as part of their reopening plan, a remote option. So I don't know that I see that part changing, but something that just came out recently and parents might be aware of this is New York State Department of Health adopted some of the CDC guidance that had come out previously, which allowed for schools to move students closer than six feet um, and no longer recommends the use of barriers. But there was an important caveat to that. And that was that if your county that you live in is a rated by the CDC as a high risk uh, transmission, you could not, you know, it, it provided restrictions. So unfortunately, Suffolk County is still in that high risk, you know, zone. So if that change is looking forward to September and there is a reduction in whatever metrics are used to make that determination, perhaps there would be an opportunity to, you know, remove barriers uh, from the classrooms. But again, that's really only based on, on the, the measures that are, that are present there. Uh, another thing that might change, I know you saw the letter that went out uh, today about the in-person meetings, uh, the Board of Education meetings. So now we can hold meetings up to 100 individuals. So, you know, that aspect might change as well, where if the county and in the, in our area continues on a good trajectory to reduce transmission and, re and reduce the number of positive cases, um, perhaps we can have more in-person events. And that, I would certainly welcome that. I look forward to the day of having, you know, concerts in person and art shows in person and, and all these great events that we, we want to have, uh, certainly our athletics and uh, award ceremonies, things of that nature that we would love to hold, you know, in person uh, in, in the future. Uh, you know, but that, that's my hope. Uh, but as I said at the start, and I'll finish that way, is that, you know, guidance sometimes comes out without warning and it changes things. And, and so we have to just be uh, you know, rest assured that the district is going to continue to keep the community aware of things that come out and how that might change uh, the experiences of our students in school. Thank you. Okay, so next year, will there still be a remote option if a student has to quarantine or if a student has a medical issue and would normally receive homeschooling through the district? Can they now log on remotely since we have this option and could save the district some money. All right, so kind of like what I said before about the remote option, right? It's, it's I don't, that's in the hands of the state, not, not in our hands. I don't necessarily see that going away, but um, we shall see. Uh, but homeschooling is different, right? Home instruction, I should say. Home instruction is different. Uh, home instruction for medical issues, for um, suspensions, uh, that is going to still continue. So we're going to have, um, you know, if your child is, is injured and can't tell, attend school for a long period of time, and when I say long, you know, each case is different, but, uh, or, or an out, out of school suspension, um, you know, the district provides home instruction, and that's, that's the best method of instruction for students uh, to receive when they're, when they're out for either one of those issues. So that's, that's going to certainly continue. Um, the remote thing we'll we'll see where that where that lands when we're in September. Okay. okay. So will the high school barriers be cleaned daily? If not, if a student tests positive, will all students who sat at that desk for the 48 hour look back have to quarantine? 
All right, good question. Um, so the, the the barriers are sanitized. Well, the desk, the barrier, was sanitized each night, right? We don't, we can't go between classes and sanitize them, but they're sanitized each night. The, uh, but I think it's important to identify what a close contact is. So just one more time, because I know you've, everybody on the screen has heard it a, bu a bunch of times, but a close contact is anybody within six feet of a positive individual for 10 minutes or more, um, within that 48 hours look back from either the onset of symptoms or the positive test. So in that particular uh, question, the answer would be no, um, unless any student that was, like I said, met that criteria within six feet. So it's just because if, if I'm sitting here at my desk and I'm positive and I get up and another student comes in and sits at that same desk, no, that's not considered a close contact. There would be no mandated, mandated quarantine. Um, but it's important to understand that what we teach our kids and what we teach our kids is about personal hygiene, washing their hands, sanitizing their hands, teaching them not to touch their eyes, their nose, their mouth, their face, uh, unless they, you know, after washing their hands, um, because that's the best way to avoid transmission. In addition to, of course, wearing the face covering, which is the most important aspect of, of avoiding transmission. So I hope I, I think I answered that question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, the next one too is two parts. I'll give you both parts. And then if we have to go back, I can ask you again. So the first part is, has there been a final determination on the New York State Regents and how HF will proceed with the grade affecting the transcript? And then the second part is other high schools have sent home notifications to students while regents are still being given this year, students may opt out. If students opt out, does this affect the ability to graduate with a regents diploma? Great question. And the guy, the letter from us is coming out. Um, if not tomorrow, what's today's Thursday? Yeah, tomorrow, we'll, we'll send it out. Um, but I'm gonna give a little bit of a long-winded answer because I think it's important that people understand. So, you know, New York State provides assessments, but much of the testing that goes on in New York State is tied to federal aid to states. So New York State applied for a waiver from the federal government to not test. You know, the New York State Education Department felt that this is not the time to be testing students. And they applied for a waiver from the federal government to not give this the three through eight assessments and the, and the regions exams. Ultimately, that waiver was rejected. So New York State uh, put out guidance to schools now just recently, and that's why you're seeing the letters come out now is that, and, and that guidance says that, uh, you know, we're gonna provide the three through eight ass assessments, a modified version, and some of the New York State Regents exams, only four of them, algebra, earth science, living environment, and English. So those are just those four. So if you're in another class like uh, chemistry or physics or global history, there's no Regents exam for you to take, all right? Um, so, You'll see this letter tomorrow, so don't feel like anybody listening, you have to jot down notes, you'll, you'll see the letter. Uh, but students will not be required to, in those classes, algebra, earth science, living environment, and English are not going to be required to sit for those exams. Um, if they do not take the exam, they'll be exempt. Just like last year, if a student was in a Regents course, they met the requirement for that course and they didn't have to take the Regents exam. Same thing this year, you don't have to take the exam. So, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll receive an exempt if you don't take it. If a do, student does decide to take the exam, they can take it and see what grade they get. But the beauty of it is they don't have to necessarily have that on their transcript. They can see what the grade is and then make a decision later at, at, in time as to whether or not they want that to appear on their transcript. So you might take, let's say, an algebra regions this year, get the grade, and then in your junior year, when you're sitting with your guidance counselor for your college planning process, you might say, you know what? I want that grade on my transcript because it's a good grade. Or no, I don't think that reflects my abilities. I don't want that grade there. And you'll get the E for exempt. And that'll all be explained, um, like I said, tomorrow in, in, in the letter. So, you know, that that's, that's the options that students have with regard to the uh, exam, whether to take it or not, whether they, grade appears on the transcript or not. And again, the beauty of it is regardless of what decision is made, it doesn't impact the ability of the student to graduate 
with the Regis diploma. So that's, it's all good news with regard to that um, process. Okay, I'll turn it over. Thank you soon. All right, so a couple of questions, multi-part questions from our LMS PTA. Um, will there be some type of in-house evaluation of students at the end of the year to determine gaps in learning? Uh, possibly summer work for those that want it or possibly a summer academy? So, I mean, the short answer to that is, is yes on the assessments, as I said before, and that applies to really all grade levels across all departments are, are just as a normal process, education process, our teachers are constantly assessing students. So the assessment of students, we don't need one large exam to do that for us. You know, like if students sit for a regions, that doesn't mean that's the first time that the teacher's realizing that there might be learning needs with that particular child. Obviously that assessment goes on through the entire year as part of the educational process. So yes, the learning gaps will be identified. As part of, of summer work uh, or summer academy, that's something that we're in the process of developing at the moment. Right now, if you look back at last year, we had provided those uh, summer boost programs for all students, they were available to all students. We're gonna be looking to put together uh, a version of that for this year, for this summer as well, to those families that wanna take advantage of it. Um, I'm not ready really to talk about details yet. Uh, as you know, we're, we're in the budget development process and we, we're going through a bunch of things to make sure that we have everything that we need to make something like that happen. Uh, but we're, we're, you know, we're working on, on plans to put summer support for our students in place. Great, thank you. So we will keep an eye out for more info yeah, on yeah. that. Um, and then a little different topic. Students are currently not allowed to use Chromebooks during lunch recess at LMS due to COVID. Uh, what is the rationale behind that? And now that they are back full time, will this change? I, I, I heard this one recently and, um, you know, it, it's, it's not about COVID, it's, it's about, um, you know, just students having to take a break from screens, um, you know, and, and telling students that, you know, we're at recess and let's get involved, let's socialize. Uh, as we know, the socialization piece was a main driver for our consideration in wanting to bring students back. Um, because again, I ex speak from experience with my own children. I know that this pandemic has impacted them and their socialization. And that's not their fault, it's not my fault, it's just the way it is. And so, um, you know, the, the struggle for us as educators and us as parents is to provide those opportunities where we can uh, have our students socialize and be in social settings and, and interact with other children and, and teachers and, and develop those social skills that we know are so vital for their social emotional well being as well as their future success. So uh, that's, that's the main driver behind that decision. It sounds like it makes a lot of sense. All right. Uh, so Lisa, I think you have the rest of our questions from TJ and Washington Drive. I do. And Dr. Manning, you've answered the majority of them, but we will ask okay. them. And then if there's anything additional you want to add, um, that would be great. Okay. So from TJLPTA, uh, many parents of full remote students are planning for their students to return in person in the fall. What is the plan to support these students in their return? And what, actually we'll do this separately. So what is the plan to support these students in their return? Obviously you've already addressed um, the learning gaps question that's across yeah. the board. But um, can I add to that? Because yes. I think it's an important part of it is that, you know, students that haven't, let's say they're transitioning from, let's say they're third grade, they were third grade this year at TJL and they were remote. They've never physically entered the building mm -hmm. for, their, for TJL at all, right? They were in Washington Drive before that. So in those cases, like I, we would encourage parents to, to contact the school and make sure that, you know, we are able to transition them much like we would for the second graders having an orientation, you know, those kind of things. We have to be, keep in mind that some of our students that have been remote for the entire year that transition buildings may not have entered the building. And so, you know, I would just encourage parents to contact the school, explain the situation. And I know our staff would go above and beyond to make any child feel welcome. So uh, it's, it's more than, you know, just learning gaps, but transition, if there's anxiety about coming back, again, just communicate that to school. We have the, the, the resources available through 
through our staff and psychologists, social worker, uh, anything you know a, a child needs to transition, um, we'll look to put in place to make sure all students feel supported. Great. And the second part of that question, and you know, again, this goes back to state mandates and everything, but what is our COVID mitigation plan for next year? Safety <laughs> protocols, testing, remote availability for quarantine or to elect a remote option? Yeah, so um, the last one is the, probably the easiest is that, you know, if there's a remote option available, it'll be available and, and that's that's the one it is. As far as the COVID mitigation plan is really gonna be dependent on the guidance at that time. Um, as you know, we have a reopening plan. It's very extensive. It's on our website, you can read it. Um, it's not all that entertaining, but you can read it there. But if there are uh, additional guidance that come out that uh, provides an opportunity for us to do things differently or to, to provide different safety protocols, uh, we're gonna do that. And so, um, you know, what I would ask any, anybody with that question is, you know, feel free that, you know, over the summer months, if you have concerns about the return to school in September based on information that you heard or, or didn't hear, uh, just contact the school and, and we'll try to answer any questions that you have. We want to make everybody feel safe. Uh, one thing I, I can point to as a matter of, you know, just being factual is that we've done what I believe to be an excellent job. If you go back to August, when we opened schools, we didn't know what we were going to expect. I heard some say, you know, oh, schools will be closed by October. Don't worry about it. And, and we made it throughout the year and we learned a lot. We learned a whole lot uh, about our operation in this type of environment. And I feel based on, you know, the, the data and uh, on our experiences that, um, you know, we couldn't have done a better job. Like we've done an excellent job keeping schools open, keeping students safe, uh, reducing, eliminating the risk of transmission within schools and uh, still moving forward, providing opportunities such as sports and music and all these things. You know, we had music at 12 feet apart. Thankfully now they can go to six feet apart. So physical education, same thing, like providing opportunities for students at recess at, at all levels to, to play and have fun. Um, it's not the same in all places. And I'm, I'm really just, I'm so proud of that. And, and I can go on forever, but uh, you know, that that's, I think just important to note that we, We've done so much, and uh, if, if people feel unsafe, we'll be happy to work with them in any way we can. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Traffic on Pulaski. <laughs> this is the next question. <laughs> um, making a left from the TJL parking lot at morning drop off and afternoon pickup causes heavy congestion on Pulaski and can be dangerous. Are there plans to have security, like a traffic cop, direct this flow to mitigate this issue? Yeah, if I if I had unlimited funding, I might just take TJL's parking areas and just redesign the whole thing. It's 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 a factor of the the, the just the layout of the, of the parking lots. It was obviously never meant for what we're going through now. Uh, but you have that large parking lot, and then you have the bus loop in the middle, and you have another parking lot, and it, the flow is just not not there as it is in other buildings. Um, so I understand what people are saying is that when you make that left out of that main lot, there is no, there is no stop sign, no traffic light, and it can be dangerous. Um, the only thing I would say to that is just gotta be, we gotta drive carefully, right? Like we can't take risks making a left if there's oncoming traffic, we gotta be really careful. And I know that's difficult and easier said than done, but please just continue to drive safely. Um, but one thing I just, I have to say is I can't put my security guard on a road to block traffic. So that's just something that, that can happen. They can direct traffic within our parking lots. I know that doesn't help the answer to this question, but it, uh, that's, that's how we use our security guards, but I can't put them on Pulaski Road to stop, that, to stop traffic. So um, again, I just encourage people to, to drive responsibly. I know this is not the right answer, but I myself, if I have trouble making a left on a main road, sometimes I make a right and I find a way to make, to turn around. That's just me. But everybody else, I know it's, it's not the most ideal and frustrating thing. Um, I just, you know, I long for the day when more students will take those, uh, what I call yellow limousines uh, to school that might reduce, the, uh, reduce that traffic. And ha has there been any consideration about 
parents being able to drive at TJL for pickup as they do at Washington Drive and the other schools or? Oh, you mean like um, sit in the, stay in the car? Stay in the car, yeah, yeah, as they do in the morning. They do it in the morning, just not in the afternoon. Um, so has, has there been any discussion about that? The morning is very different than the afternoon. So the morning you pull up, your kid comes out of the car, you go in, right? That's pretty basic and the parent drives off. The pickup, you would have to have the child there waiting. Um, and so, it, as you know, TJL is far away from that parking lot. So you would have to basically line all the walkers up outside. Um, but then you run into an even a bigger problem in that the line of cars would definitely spill out onto Pulaski Road and you would have no, no ability for those cars that might be a little bit late. I know people get there really early, but you, you would have no ability to make the left into, or the right, I should say, into the parking lot because the back, the traffic would just be backed up. And then that would create a log jam because then, as you know, it's a circle, people couldn't get out. Other buildings like Washington Drive are laid out very differently. Where you, if those of you have been there in the afternoon for pickup, you have that long lot on the side that you drive through, then you have the long loop in the front that you drive through, and then you have the side lot that you drive through, and they're all connected. So it allows for parents to get off of Washington Drive and then not creating a traffic situation on Washington Drive. That situation doesn't exist at TJL. You can't, we can't put enough cars in that lot to not create backup traffic into Pulaski Road. We have looked at it. I've learned more about traffic patterns than I ever want to know in my life, but, you know, I wish there was another way, but you know, obviously we would continue to assess anything uh, that, that, that we can do. And there may be an increased use of the yellow limousines next year. So limousines. We'll see, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation too. Um, from Washington Drive PTA, uh, will Summer Academy be running at Washington Drive this summer and will it be in person or virtual? So yes, Summer Academy will be uh, taking place at both Washington Drive and TJL. It, we are working on an in-person plan for that. That's the intention of this. Um, like I said, we're also working on plans for enhanced summer learning support for students. Um, I will say the one caveat to this, and I just wanna put it out there. We are doing a lot of construction as part of the bond this summer. We're air conditioning gyms, we're ventilation, we have some security vestibules going in. Um, right here at OMS, we're re redoing the entire uh, fire alarm system. Um, when you do construction like that, it does limit your ability to use spaces. And that's going to be a consideration when we look at the, the expanding that. But going back to your basic question, at Washington Drive, we are looking to do in-person summer academy for both Washington Drive and TJL, in addition to our extended year special education program. Okay, great. And you answered our last question from Washington Drive regarding a summer boost or online enrichment activities being offered to all students. So we know that that plans in the works. Yeah. And we look forward to seeing more information. Uh, that that concludes all of our questions uh, from our from all of our units. So we want to thank our PTA volunteers, thank our PTA board members for pulling those together and connecting with the community so we can make sure that uh, we're getting the answers that everyone's looking for. And Dr. Manning, thank you so much for taking the time this evening to join us. And thank you, Sue, for joining us as well. And if anyone has any other questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Manning and, and his administrative team. They, they are always available and very, very generous with their time. So. Uh, and you can, of course, reach out to myself and Natalie, too, if you have any questions specific to PTA. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing everybody uh, at our in-person meetings. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Good night. Yeah. Good night.